many of you buy the concept that you could do a lot more than you're doing now with a lot less energy? All right? I'm going to make sure I convince you of that today because I believe that we use too much energy to get what we want and I believe we can use half the amount of energy to get twice as much as we want. And if you're using the amount of energy you're doing it now, you can even get more than that. For example, that most of you know I'm a pilot. I've done a lot of flights and stuff with uh, Gene and Brittany. We've done a lot of cool stuff together. Let's say we're in the jet and I'm taking everybody from the Bahamas and we're going from the Bahamas to New York. Obviously in the Bahamas there is no snow. So when we land to New York, let's say for whatever reason we're going to take a, a little break, get back in the jet. But before we do... There's a lot of snow and rain, and it starts getting on the airplane. Now, on the way to New York, we were, let's say we just were at full throttle, 100% throttle, and we're doing 500 miles an hour. Now, if we take off from New York to come back down with some of the light sheet of snow, very, very light, it could be as thick as a grain of sand. Do you realize if we took off and we used 100% of power, we would probably do half the amount of speed, and if we accumulate more, will end up crashing. Hmm. Think about that. So a lot of times you don't even know that you have ice or anything like that accumulating on your aircraft. My point here is, would you be willing to agree, open-minded, honest, humble, that you might have some things on your wing causing you drag in your life that's slowing you down from having more personal success and financial success yesterday. Yes, sir. would be yes. crazy not to agree with that. And by the way, I appreciate all of you participating because you can't change what you don't acknowledge. So today is just a, an open day. I know most of you are getting like a family. After you've been here a while with each other, you get to know each other. And as Gene mentioned, I'm going to hang around here. Uh, I have no major plans to get home at any specific time. So uh, not, not that, that I want to leave at 3 o'clock in the morning. But if you want to take advantage of having me and have some time with me, you know, feel free to do that. I'd be happy to spend a little time with you today. So I want to talk about the ability to make some change and how fast uh, change can be made. Um, I'm obsessed with how quick I can get people to change and I can get companies to change. I'm just obsessed with it. Um, and once you learn specific principles, you can take these principles and you can apply them to anything in life. And I'm going to give you a variable of tons of different principles and ways that change can be made very, very quickly, whether it be a business strategy, a flying strategy, a phobia strategy. Here, here's a typical example. Um, I don't typically carry a syringe with me, but today I decided I'd bring a syringe with me. So I had a lady uh, about, I don't know, maybe two years ago. She saw me on a TV show, and this woman had a massive, I mean massive phobia of syringes. If I said, here's a syringe, she would literally be in tears. If I'm not careful, she'd probably pass out and faint. It was that bad. It was ridiculous. So she decided to seek me out. She hired me. And I just found out actually about a month and a half ago what her therapist did. She was in therapy for a year and a half. All she could get to was the point of lifting her sleeve up so she could prepare possibly in the future to get a shot. A year and a half later. So what does Gary do? Again, I think, I try to, how do I get things faster? How do I get things faster? Now, the nervous system is one of the things that I use to reprogram people, reprogram your thought process, your emotions, your mind. The nervous system cannot tell the difference between imagination and reality. Mm -hmm. Example, um, say for a moment that I've got fingernails that are very long, I'm going to rub them across a dry chalkboard. How many of you felt a little something right now? Some of us felt something. How could you have felt something when my fingernails are not long and I don't have a dry chalkboard? Because I planted a picture in your mind, your nervous system reacted to the picture, and then you created an experience from that. So if I know that, if I know that the nervous system cannot tell the difference between imagination and reality, wouldn't it make sense then to learn how to program or reprogram your nervous system? And if you know how to do it, you can get results faster. Yes or yes? yes. Yeah. So here's what I did with this lady. So she's afraid of a syringe, can't even show it to her. Now I do all of my work, I would say 99.99% of my work, I do it all virtually. So I got her husband to be my buddy assistant. And I said to him without her even knowing, now keep in mind, I lay a foundation. I can't just tell her what I'm gonna tell you and have her change quickly. The foundation is laid, once the foundation is laid, I then go ahead and implement a strategy and it works very quickly. So I said to her husband without her being there, I had her, I had him order a bunch of syringes, and I said, I want you to take the syringe, and I want you to chop it up in little tiny pieces, little tiny pieces. This is a syringe in little tiny pieces. So then we're ready for the therapy, and now remember, if you are deathly phobic of something or traumatized or have trauma because of 
uh, emotional, physical, sexual abuse, uh, loss of a loved one, it could be anything. If it's severe trauma and I mention it to you, you are going to feel a feeling. Yes or yes? Everybody yes. can experience, right? Similar like you're driving down a road, you hear a song. It can bring you a good feeling, it can bring you a bad feeling. Same thing. So what I did to confuse your mind, I would just have something on my desk. It could be anything. I could say, in just a moment, I want you to pretend. Now, if you're deathly phobic and you pretend this remote is a syringe, it is a syringe to you, you will respond negatively. Does that make sense? All right? This is why I can never be faked. Because I understand the programming of the nervous system. I've had TV shows bring me people on who are pretending to be phobic, and I knew for a fact they weren't because I know how they will respond, and they don't know how to respond if they're being fake. But if you're real, I know in advance how you're gonna respond. So her nervous system responded, even though she knew this wasn't a syringe. Once she started getting the idea, I said, okay, let me go get something else. We're gonna get a piece of plastic. She doesn't know what the plastic is from. And we put it in her hand. I said, your husband's gonna put it in your hand. Is that a problem? And it's the syringe. No problem. She knows it's in her mind not until we eventually get the entire pieces of the syringe in her hand. I have her close her hand. I say, take a guess what's in your hand. She had no idea. I said, that's a syringe cut up. Boom. Change made immediately. And she literally, in one session, was holding a syringe, which she should ne could never do. In fact, it was so bad, she couldn't even watch TV because she was afraid that maybe a TV show might have some, especially if it was like an emergency room or a hospital thing. She would never be able to even watch the TV because there may be a possibility of a syringe on the TV. So my point here is telling you that when you have something that you're doing in your life, it's kind of like a fly if you're not careful. If you've got a fly here and it's trying to get out the window and it keeps hitting the window and hitting the window and hitting the window and doesn't get out, there's an easier way to do it with a lot less energy. Mr. Fly, take your time, come down to the windowsill, walk your way over, and the window is open and fly out. Because if you're doing this, you're pushing a parked car. You're active, but we're active accomplishing nothing. Now, I know that we're all active doing things. We're all active in our relationships. We're all active in our businesses. But to some degree, you could be active, even though you're getting results. may not be great results. Maybe they are great, but there could be a possibly better way. So I'll share with you another example how I would do this in aviation, but I'm going to share with you how you have programmed your thoughts, whether they are in the future or in the past, to get the emotional results that you get now. And if you want to change those emotional results, you have the ability to do that. Why do you want to do that? Everything you do is based on what? Emotions. Everything. And the sad thing about this group, and I say sad thing because most of this group are men. Men, we have a problem. You know what it is? We have a problem talking about our feelings. Women feel first. Kim is just smiling. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> and so is Brittany. Women feel first, think second. Men think first, feel second. You see there's a problem if both parties don't understand each other? Right? Oh. Okay? Yeah. So the point here is men feel that we're weaker, not all, but in, in society, We've been programmed to feel that we're weaker if we show emotion. I was with a billion dollar company and I spoke to one of the managers in this company and the company, uh, one of the, the, the actual owner died and he was telling me the story about he was mentioning this to all his employees and he was about to cry, he had to excuse himself. He wanted to excuse himself and did excuse himself because he did not want to appear weak. The problem with that is, is if you think you appear weak by showing emotion, then when you have to release some of that emotion and you don't, you will find some other very, very negative, wrong way to do it. And then the other thing that you must keep in mind, all of us, when somebody shares with you emotion, you must be careful you do not punish them. Because if you punish them once, they will feel, I'm not going to talk to the next person because I just tried over here. I don't want to be punished emotionally again. Punishing means I cannot believe that bothers you. That's punishing a person for sharing their thoughts. Mm -hmm. Punishing them means, oh, come on, you can do better than that. I know you can get through this. Now is not the right time to say that. Weep with those who weep. Rejoice with those who rejoice. All right? So, let me share with you one more example. Then we go into the, the nitty gritty. How many of you enjoying this stuff so, so far, right? I, I just get obsessed with this stuff. All right. So, um, I'm a flight instructor. I don't do this for a living, but, you know, it's just something I do to keep myself uh, uh, on top of my game as a, as a pilot. So here's what's quite interesting. So here's a runway, right? Here's a runway. And 
when somebody's learning to fly, they, we, they fly in what we call a pattern. The pattern is you land, you take off, you come back around again, and you land again. Now, the most challenging part of all this, I mean, you can teach a monkey to turn an airplane left and right, up and down. It's pretty, it's pretty easy. The challenging part is the last 10 seconds. That's going to make or break you. That's going to, yeah, you're going to mess it up there or you're going to do well. Now, once you learn to fly, your instructor, your CFI, Certified Flight Instructor, what your instructor is going to do, he's going to take you around this pattern so you can learn this over and over and over again. So let's say, depending on the airport you're at, this will take about 10 minutes to do. 10 minutes to do what we call a touch and go, a touch and go. You land, you take off, and you come around. So in an hour, we can do six of these. Does that make sense? Six times 10 is 60 minutes. In an hour, we can do six touch and goes, OK? Now, here's where Gary comes in. There's got to be a smarter way to teach somebody to be a better pilot. So here's what I do, OK? If I know that a monkey can do all this, and it takes a lot of monkeys to do this right, <laughs> the last 10 seconds, this is the part that you really want to be skilled at. So here's what I do. I'll take you in the airplane. The last 10 seconds we touch. We go back up, we do it again, we go back up, we do it again, and then we come around. In one hour, how many touch and goes have we done? 18, 18. 18 touch and goes, three times per segment. So we're now doing 18 touch and goes. I'm getting you three times faster and better than the average instructor. I'm not saying that to brag or anything, but just, you know, you understand the principle here. So the next question is, so Gary, why do instructors not teach this? Well, here's why. Number one, if you're observing this as a pilot or not, you are going to think somebody is drunk. Literally. I'm not kidding. So I, I call the tower in advance. I'm going to let them know, look, we're going to do some maneuvers. I'm going to promise you it's going to look a little crazy. How much time do I have that? I'm just, I just want to. So um, I call the tower up and say, look, you know, I'm going to do some stuff here. It's going to look a little crazy. So we're all fine. We're OK. Everything is cool. And they get that. So the number one reason, or one of the reasons people don't do that, other instructors, is they're too concerned about what other people think. You are going to think, I am really a screwed up instructor if I'm teaching people this way. But they're not thinking out of the box. They're not thinking smarter, right? Make, make sense? Right. Now, the next thing, why would be another reason for somebody not to teach this? Well, if you're an instructor, 90% of all instructors out there have one goal in mind, and it's not to teach you. It's to get to the airlines. So to get to the airlines, they need to get about 1,500 hours. So the quickest way to get to the airlines is become an instructor. And now when you become an instructor, what happens is they pay you to fly instead of you paying to fly. All right? Now, as an instructor, would I want to get to my 1,500 hours, like, really, really take forever to do it? Or I want it, like, really quick? Well, they don't want you to learn super, super fast because they can't eat up a lot of time. They want to do it as slow as they possibly can so they can get there. Therapists are the same way. <laughs> Think about it. Does a therapist want to get you changed very quickly? No. Not normally, no. What they want, they want a hundred of you once a week for the rest of your life. It's a great model. My model sucks. Right? But I can't sleep at night unless you're a business entrepreneur. I can, I can have you for years going with strategy after strategy because things are always changing and moving. But if you come to me with a psychological problem and I can't, I, here's my claim. If I can't get you to do whatever it is you have not been able to do in 5 or 10 or 15 years, if I can't do it in one session with you, I will not take you on as a client. I just don't do it. I just, I, that's, it doesn't excite me to see you once a week with the same problem for the next year or two. That's just like some some. Both of us need, problem, uh, need fixing, <laughs> if that's the case. You, know, you fact, spending all the money. Now, what about the medication? Pharma, $82 billion a year. You are programmed. SAD, Social Anxiety Disorder. That was made up in the 70s. Uh, a pharmaceutical company says, you know what, let's do this. Let's make up uh, SAD, Social Anxiety Disorder. Then they come up with this massive, huge campaign that they spent about half a million to a million dollars to create the TV commercial and another $350,000 or more to run the commercial for 30 seconds. And then... I strongly suggest you jot this next statement down. If you don't want to take notes, it's kind of easy to remember, but it... Brain will validate all of your beliefs, whether they are right or wrong. Lots of 
Now, with that being said, back to the commercial. Somebody has some anxiety. How many of you have ever had anxiety before? Show of hands. Who hasn't? Right? So now you see a commercial about social anxiety. Are you getting your heart increased rate? Blah, blah, blah. So now your brain validates, oh, maybe that's my problem. So now you're culturally hypnotized by the media, and then you go get the meds, and you're all supposedly better. And then, and then they have a, a, a disclaimer that says, I got this one, I do this in one of my uh, programs, I don't have it with me. There's one sleeping pill, sleeping pill, right? Medication, check this out, that tells you the side effects of this medication is sleepiness, that's one. You're taking a sleeping pill to go to sleep, but the biggest side effect is sleepiness. That doesn't make any sense. The other one is, you may end up driving a vehicle eating breakfast or creating a meal or making a meal and not know you did it. They literally say that on the TV commercial. Can you imagine? So my point here is I like to work with people in a whole stretch, the whole body, the whole mind, everything. There's a reason I am not 100 pounds overweight. There is a reason I mentally don't take anything to wake me up. I don't need anything to go to bed. My first text this morning was at 3.20 this morning. She's smiling because she knows I'm 24-7. I'm and it's not necessarily 24-7. When I sleep, I'm out like a light. I take care of my body because I don't want that drag on my wings. And when I see that drag, I'm human. I, I was talking to Gene just two days ago when I came here. I said, man, I had a freaking rough day. I'll admit I have drag and I had to get the drag off right away. The key is if you're not willing to admit it and you don't know how, what's worse than being discouraged or depressed is not knowing why. Because if you don't know why, how are you going to get the how to fix it? It doesn't make any sense, all right? So let me share with you some psychological challenges and thought process that, that we have that really condition and program us that are a lot of fun. Gary speaks at about 300 words a minute with just about 1,000. All right, so here we go. Hang on. Until you're a person, then I'll Then I'll slow it down. Okay, write this down. My future is my present. My future is my present. So initially, what does that mean? So here we are. All right. And we have a thought in the future. And let's say that thought is a negative thought. So we project a negative thought in the future. How many of you have projected a negative thought in the future and you kept going so much it was like a movie, right? right? Yes, yes or yes? yes. I, I mean, you, we, we just, just make a crap like this. This isn't happening. I mean, we, we go, go on and on. on. So remember, your future, the future thought you have becomes your present. The, the present emotions you experience right now are either coming from your future thought or what's the other one? The past, the negative thought. Past negative. Now, now I shared with you in this video, video or in the video, video shared with you that I've gone through a tremendous amount of trauma. And I share this with you not to get your sympathy, but to just give you an idea that if, if you come to me with any challenge you have, have I may not have been through the same challenge, but I can feel your pain. So in the video shared that I was very successful when I was 17 years old, I was making like over hundred thousand dollars. This was decades ago, so that's well over millions, millions and millions of dollars today. Then I got married. My, my wife and I have, have a baby, and later, later on she tells me that that baby really wasn't mine. Wow. That was not even. Then at a the time frame of all this, my, my grandfather set out that cancer. My, my uncle was killed in a plane crash. I got a phone, phone call from my mother to let me know that my father had just been shot point blank in his chest and drowned in his own blood. And, and then, then to top it all off, because all that, that I just shared with you, I'm not making fun of myself, but that's, that's all the hate law compared to what I'm going to share with you next. I was born and raised in a cult. And I left that cult about 15 years ago. And when you leave that cult, your so-called friends and family will shun you for life, and they will treat you as if you were dead. So that means that I am now all by myself. That has been the most challenging thing to experience compared to all the other things that I shared with you combined. So I remember. One day, right after this, I'm traveling by myself. I happen to be going commercially this time. I had one of these big carts that you get at the airport. I had all my luggage on the car. I was I'm pushing the luggage. All the luggage just fell to the ground, and I broke down to tears. 
I just broke down in tears. Why? I immediately went to my past, and all I thought, subconsciously, was everything that I had lost. And immediately it put me in the present. So then, write this down. My past is my present. My past is my present. So what I had to do then is I have to learn and have to clean this out so where I could change that. Now keep in mind, one of your goals in life I think should be is if you can learn to change the pain that you've experienced and no longer associate pain to it. You and I were talking about that, right? I was telling you about how do I know how to change, uh, program my birds and, and change their behavior. It's two things, pain or pleasure. That's it. So if you can learn to minimize the psychological pain through the nervous system or some other means, and you minimize the pain where you see the gain higher than the pain, you get more results. It's called loss of aversion. Loss of, not a virgin, but a version. Loss <laughs> of a virgin. What that means is, statistically, check this out, the average person statistically will avoid a loss or a pain than to gain a gain. So the way of putting it, we like to hit course of these resistance. Don't be normal. The average statistics show this is what people do. And what happens is this creates the fight or flight mechanism in our brain. Fight or flight. So anytime you have trauma, um, a severe phobia, whatever it is, and every time you get this fight or flight, fight or flight, you try and you mean well, you want to go forward, but you pull back and you flight as opposed to fighting. Because fighting, you show in your mind that there's too much pain to it. And what happens is we never make change. So when we learn psychologically how to change that, we make massive, massive change because that fight or flight becomes more drag on your aviation wings, on your lifestyle. So the next thing that is, well, how do we change all that? Well, the first thing that you're going to do after you think in the future and think in the past that makes you sad, the first thing you're told to do, well, you've got to change your breathing. So we change our breathing. How many of you ever try to change your breathing with anxiety and it feels good for about 30 seconds and you still have the same problem? Okay? So does that work? Yes. But if you don't have the right foundation, it will not be long lasting. For example, I do cold plunging at 45 degrees. I will tell you, you have to learn to control your breathing. But if I give you 45 degrees right now and say just control your breathing, you're not going to stay in there for 10 or 20 minutes with me. It's just not going to happen. But would I tell you the truth? Yes, you have to control your breathing. But you need the foundation to do that. So the next thing would be, okay, Gary, we've got to change our words. Right? How, how many of us know that words are extremely powerful, right? I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's the game right there. But let's say that I walk around and I say, but I can't. I can't. I can't. Mm. Now, the moment I say I can't, I can't, I can't, there's always going to be somebody in the room that says, but Gary, say you can. can. Mm. So I walk around saying I can, I can, I can, I can, until I'm blue in the face. The bottom line is, is if I still think I can't, right. even though I say I can, then I can't. So then, the words are important, but we've got to go a step further. So, I'm going to draw, this is going to be my foot. I'm not the best artist in the world, so here's, here's my foot right here. So years ago, I had a motorcycle accident on my left foot here. Um, a friend of mine, he has a house, and right around the house is a nice sharp road. The uh, rain had just came in, the road was all wet. Everybody's riding his motorcycle, so I asked him, hey, you know, can I ride your motorcycle? He goes, yeah. So I get ready to make a turn. Instead of adding to the brakes, I downshifted. Back tire locked up, went right like this, dropped on my left leg, and my left foot just drug my foot into the asphalt. Go to the hospital, and I, I, have, I, I, I can show it to you. I have two holes, two scars, right in my foot. So the doctor, he gets a syringe, and I can feel the pain right now. Nervous system can't tell the difference, right? He put a syringe right inside the tendons there. One wasn't enough. He did like four here and four more there. Why did he do that? Because he had to take his pinky, go in this hole, go underneath the skin, come out that hole, take a fat syringe full of saline solution, and squirt, 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 squirt. What's he trying to squirt out? Well, the asphalt. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let's say he didn't do that, and he just washed it bandaged it up, and it said, head on out. You think I'm going to have an infection? You think if I didn't get a check, I'd eventually have gangrene and lose a leg? Sure. So if we're just doing the breathing and just saying the words, we're not getting inside deep and cleaning it out. 
And that's why many times when we try to do something that we need to change, it keeps bringing its ugly head back and back again. So I'm not saying don't say positive words, but here's a warning for you. The more you say a positive affirmation, the less you believe it, that's why you keep saying it. Let me repeat that. The more you keep saying a positive affirmation, the less you believe it, that's why you keep saying it. Now, don't walk out of here and say, Gary says don't use positive affirmations. Absolutely, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you've got to start there. If you say you can't and you want to make a change, you've got to start with words. You've got to start somewhere, right? So you're going to change the word. Now, if you keep saying, I can, I can, I can, the more you keep saying the new affirmation, it's just a measuring rod to let you know you really don't want it yet. Believe it yet. Here's an aha moment for you. And I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if I asked you this rhetorically, you would probably not know the answer. And boy, do you need to. If you believe that for every belief we act on, we get a result. So if every belief we act on, we get a result, limited or not, how do you know that you bought a belief? How do you know that you bought a belief? Here's how you know. The more you say it, the less you believe it. So when you say it and you feel it, that's when you bought a belief. So now, like for example, you ever seen somebody on these roller coaster videos on YouTube and they're like, yeah, straight down, and the person goes, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, it's gonna be okay. They don't believe it's gonna be okay because they keep saying it. Now, after they do it once, and if they're a real thrill seeker, that was fun, let's do it again. I'll guarantee you the second or third time, they don't say, I, I know I can do it, I got this, I got this. They got it, they believe it, they no longer have to say, I got this, I can do this. So when you are trying new things, for example, some of the things, some of the things that Gene is sharing with you, how many of them, even one little thing that you learned in the last day or two would be new to you, yes or yes, right? So when you try something new, you're going to get some friction. Come on. The friction, you have to be careful that you don't validate that friction to say it doesn't work. You want to use that friction to let you know. If you've convinced yourself what he's shared with you in this particular scenario, whatever it is, is going to work, but you just don't feel comfortable doing it yet, you just have to hang on there long enough to you say it, do it, and what? Yeah. Feel it. That's all you go for now. You're only going for the feeling. That's it. When you shift that way, the difference between learning to change and do the right thing to change the feeling is a lot different from, I don't think this is going to work. I'm not going to try this anymore. This is not going to work. You see the difference? It's a total different. So now, when you're looking to see, so, so if I work with somebody on a particular scenario, I'll say on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, when you say, I can, how much of it do you feel? So let's say they say, I'm at a 6. Well, they're at a 6. The goal is to get them to a what? Ten. A 10. Well, if you're at a 6, does that mean you give up? No, this is where you learn to play games with your mind instead of your mind playing games with you. So you think differently. You go, okay, I'm at a 6. Darn it. What can I do differently or better to get to a 7 or an 8 or a 9? That's a totally different fork in the road. Everybody with me on that? That's a game changer. So when you think this way, you're now guaranteed to get more results because your focus is totally different. All right. So that's basically, in a nutshell, those are some of the things that I wanted to share with you today. Um, maybe do a little Q&A if you want to do, Gene, or something like that. I don't want to, I mean, I could go on for hours and hours, and basically as fast as I speak, it's going to be like one day, it'd be like 10 days worth of stuff, and 10 days worth of stuff will be 100. All right, any questions, thoughts, ideas? Gary's very uncomfortable with silence. Okay. <laughs> so if there's anything, go ahead. You said something about like trauma and pain, and you wanted to like basically make your, your brain not associate it with pain. Mm -hmm. Do you are you like pushing that down though? Like, don't you want to feel some stuff? Like, you want to have emotion to it sometimes. Good question, and it depends. Um, if you can associate pleasure to it as crazy as it sounds, because it could be something really deep, how would you associate pleasure to that? Or change the story where it's not as painful, you won't need that. In some cases, depending on what the case is and the situation, and I would determine that in an assessment, I would determine if we need to go, we need to go deeper. Sometimes a person has a behavior, they don't even know where they got it from. Right. I'll just make up some, let's say somebody um, is afraid of a snake, just for example. Um, you could, let's say that person, this, is, this can happen. Let's say that person was two years old, now they're, I don't know, 40, whatever, 
And when they were two years old, mom and daddy sat them in front of the TV. They were watching a National Geographic show. And a little, well, not a little, a big snake or a little snake crawling across the screen on the National Geographic TV show. Baby thinks nothing of it. Baby goes to bed that night, wakes up at 2 o'clock in the morning, screams bloody murder, not old enough to let mommy and daddy know why they're screaming bloody murder, but they just had a dream of the snake swallowing them. That child can now be phobic for the rest of its life and not know why it's phobic. So in that particular case, all I know is one thing. That person has a negative association to that snake. They have a negative story to it, a negative association to touching it, looking at it, whatever. If I can change that association to where it's not negative, change happens. I'll give you a quick example if you'd like. Uh, a gentleman came to me. He had a massive uh, anxiety issue. And he did happen to know where the anxiety issue came from. The anxiety issue came from years ago when he was working, um, doing woodwork of some kind. And he was um, getting a, 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 I think it was an electric sander. He was sanding the woodwork down like crazy and just sanding it and sanding it. And then one of his bosses or supervisors came up to him and criticized him in front of everybody. And all of a sudden, it just shut him down. And from that day on, he had this anxiety problem. He couldn't go out in public hardly the whole nine years. So he brings me on. He hires me. So now i got to see, amongst other different strategies, how do I change that negative association? So I found out where it started from. If I can find that, don't have to, but if I can find that, I go back to it, and here's what I said to him. I said, okay, what we're gonna do today, we're gonna have you go to the grocery store, because he couldn't go to the grocery store without feeling like, like freaked out. I'm gonna bring your girlfriend with you, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have you go in and buy strawberries and whipped cream. And then I had him picture that table he was sanding, she was on it with strawberries and whipped cream. He's got, and I see you're laughing, he's laughing too. So now for all these years, he's been like, oh my God, this is so fearful. Look, look what this boss is, he's insulted me. But now he's just smiling because his girlfriend's on there with whipped cream and strawberries. <laughs> so now again, that's just not enough to get him to change. Once I do a foundation where I'm going to spend, you know, an hour or two laying the foundation, after that, boom, 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 boom. And these strategies are the same strategies that you would use in sales as well. Same strategies that you use with your team members. I mean, it, it, in your, with your spouse, it goes on and on. Good question, though. Any other question? And then we'll wrap up. I've heard before, I don't know if it's good advice. It seems to be okay. Like, if something made you nervous or scared, that's a sign for you to try it. Something new or something you're not comfortable with, that kind of tells you to try it and challenge yourself or whatever. Get used to trying stuff that's scary. Is there, is there truth to that? Or is there is some truth to that. I say some because I don't know the, if I knew a specific situation, I'll tell you if it's good or not. Obviously, if it's being, I'm being sarcastic here, but truthful. Obviously, if it's being at the cliff without a parachute and you're going to jump off and you're going to feel scared, you wouldn't do that, right? right? But if there's other things that are reasonable and it's something that's in harmony, here's the key. Is that feeling and going through that feeling in harmony with your goals? If it's not in harmony with your goals, why would you want to bother do it? Unless you feel the need that perhaps you should change the goal. So That's you, you would start with having goals and then, and then align anything else with that. Yeah, ultimately I would find out if that feeling, pushing through that feeling, is in harmony with my values and beliefs. Gotcha. That's it. Like some people now, the big thing now is psychedelic drugs to get you to break through whatever. That is not in harmony with my values and beliefs. I get high off my own supply. I ain't doing psychedelic drugs. <laughs> so I may feel uncomfortable. I would feel uncomfortable doing it. Now, if I change my values and beliefs, yeah, I think it'd probably be kind of cool. I don't know, but I don't care to do it because it's not in my values and beliefs. If it's in your values and beliefs, go for it. Yeah. So that's how, so that's why sometimes I'll have the five people answer me or ask me the same question, and I'll answer the question five different ways because each person has a different set of core values and beliefs. So I'm very uncomfortable, especially on social media, without talking to an individual when somebody says, you know, you know, chat me out a question and answer that question on a chat. I don't even know what your core values and beliefs are to give you a good, honest answer to make sense for you. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So I, I don't even, I don't even bother with it. So if somebody comes to me with a question, you know, it's like after I do a, a, an event, um, I tell people, I know you're going to have some questions to keep in mind. There's the short answer and the long answer. It's like if you ask me how to fly an airplane. Well, there's a short answer is you push the stick forward, the houses get closer, you pull the stick back, the houses get bigger, right? Or smaller. So if you ask me a question, and even today, you know, I'm hanging with you for hours today, if you ask me a question, I'm going to go, ah, that's one of those questions. In other words, you know, I give you the short answer, you push down, and the houses get bigger, but I'm going to need a lot more time for you. So 
that's that's how I like that. I'd rather be honest that way, right? Than give you a bunch of well, just think a little more positive and when you I need more than that. And that's how I got into a lot of this because I would read these motivational books and they'll say just think positive. And I'm thinking, okay. So how, well, where's my core though? I got to change the core. I can't just say it's not going to be that bad. You know, I got to believe it's not going to be that bad. How do I get to the point of believing it's going to be okay or it is okay? That's where the core is. All right? Anybody else? Going once. When are you, uh, when are you selling us? Oh, okay. I'll, I'll go right to that. If you, like. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's not a big deal. Everybody wants to know this part, right? I, I, I'm not a big, uh, big on closing on something like this. It's, I mean, it's, I'm only here for a short period of time. Um, I've got a program that what I'll do is it's six months or a year, and Jean will testify that corporations, and I don't do much speaking anymore, but um, typically it's 25K. I've now jumped it up to 40 to 50K for uh, 90 uh, hour and 15 minutes of my time to go in for uh, an event. So I will do a six month program. It's a 30K program where I do an assessment on you and your company for, it's usually about two hours, and then we do a group follow up once a week for the next six months. For a year, it's 50K. And I'll do it for the first three people before I leave tonight that decide to do this. I will give you a free $3,000 all-inclusive vacation package to Sandals Resorts that you can take advantage of. So if you're interested in that, see me. I'll be happy to talk to you more about it. Um, before I take anybody on, I want to find out more about you to make sure I'm the right fit for you. you got to make sure you know, you're the right fit for me as well. well. Camille is the one that manages a lot of that, so we'll chit chat if you want to chat with me later on. Um, if you want to bring me on and do this, I'll chat with you. If you don't want to do that and you want to ask me some questions, I have no problem with helping you on that. So don't feel I'm here that I won't help you if you don't want to get into my program, okay? That's not a, So if you're here and you just want to chat with me about something you got and I can help you, that's why I'm here. That's what I love to do, all right? So um, if you have any questions on that, let us know. Um, that's pretty much it. Give it up for Gary Cox. Hey.